Okay, welcome everybody. My name is Tanya Nieri and I am uh, the research lead on the Voice and Collegiate Recovery Project uh, and welcome to today's webinar. Um, so we have a couple of preliminary slides just to give you some background on the project and then I'll turn the um, mic over to our presenters for the webinar today. So recordings of this webinar will be available on our website. Um, just give us a, a week or two because we do a little bit of editing, just editing and make it will be there. So feel free to pass on the information to other people. So during the webinar, um, if you're on a computer listening, you can scroll with your mouse to the bottom or the top of your screen and this little window will come up um, where you see raise hand, Q&A or closed captioning. And that's um, all the attendees right now are currently uh, muted and that's just because so that we can manage the noise um, but if you have a question for or comment for the presenters, you can click on the Q&A button um, or you can email Evelyn uh, at the address you see there. But we recommend that you use the Q&A button, preferably if you have some problem uh, with that or you're on a phone, then you can email Evelyn. You'll see in the screen on the left hand, on your screen if you're at, on the computer, um, when you type in a, uh, if you click on the chat button, this window will pop up and so you can see what you've typed in there and click on the send button. So what we'll do is, I'm gonna give a little bit more introduction, then we'll have the presentation, we'll do question and answers, we'll try and leave about a half an hour for question and answers and comments. And then we ask you after the uh, webinar to please provide feedback. Um, there is a, a email address on your screen and we will also bring that email address up uh, at the end of the presentation so you can see it again. And then you'll also receive an email um, <laughs> an email tomorrow asking you to fill it out if you haven't. So we do really value your feedback. Also, this is a funded project. So your feedback, um, we utilize your feedback to report back to funders um, and to guide our next steps in the funded project. So we really invite you to provide us that feedback. Before we go to today's presenters, I just wanna provide you a background. The project is called Voice in Collegiate Recovery and it's an engagement project, which is to say that um, we here at uh, UC Riverside are engaging with members of the collegiate recovery community on campus. So that means students, faculty, staff, providers that work with students who are in recovery, and also people off campus. So practitioners, healthcare providers, uh, families, um, fr friends and allies of people who are, of students who are in recovery. Our goal is to find out what is needed for to support college students in recovery in terms of research. So what are the unanswered questions? And then think about how to go about addressing them in research. So we are in the engagement, we're engaging the community. And one of the ways we're doing that is by first having conversations with presenters, right, through these webinars, so that we know what the issues are and that the community can attend these webinars and through the question and answer period and comment period, also participate and give their feedback. And then of course, we follow up with that email to also ask, not only did you like the webinar, what did you learn, but also where should we go from here? So your, part your participation today is uh, very much appreciated. And I'm very excited to produce to you the presenters of today's webinar. So I'm gonna start out of order um, in terms of the bullet points you see on the slide there. So Danielle Cravalo is gonna get us started off. She's a doctoral student in the School of um, Psychology program here at UC Riverside. Um, she will then be joined uh, and alternate presentations with Jennifer Taylor, who's a life marriage and family therapist. And she's been working with adults, young adults since 2007. And then uh, towards the end of the uh, presentation and hopefully for the majority of the question and answer section, Keith Gaucher will join us. So he is a local practitioner. He's a certi certified substance use disorder counselor uh, with over 30 years of experience. And um, he's currently practicing here in the Riverside area. And he's one of our collaborators uh, in the Voice and Collegiate Recovery project, um, project. So with that, I will turn it over to today's presenters. Uh, and thank you again, all of you and attendees for being here. This is Danielle speaking. And as Tanya mentioned, I'm a doctoral student in school psychology, and I'm also a part of the research project. So I opted to be a part of this webinar because I personally help lead some of the collegiate recovery initiatives at UC Riverside. So this was a particular interest of mine, and I wanted to kind of dive into what the research says. So part of this webinar, we're going to discuss several topics. We're gonna talk about different interventions that are provided on college campuses 
what's kind of seen throughout the literature, but then also from UC Riverside's perspective, and Jennifer is a practitioner at UC Santa Barbara, so she'll provide input on that. And then we're going to dive into what the academic literature says about collegiate recovery interventions, and then provide us throughout the webinar a little bit about what is known, what's not known, and what we can do to provide future research and gain a little bit a better understanding on how we can support students in recovery. And so our learning objectives just kind of mimic of what we are going to be discussing. So we'll talk about typical on-campus services. We'll talk about different resources also provided in the community. And then we'll just touch on a little bit the role that family and friends play in a person's recovery. All right, so I'm going to jump into what is recovery? I feel like sometimes not a lot of people are a little bit unsure on how recovery is defined. And that's pretty common. There's a lack of standard definition for this term, which honestly hinders public understanding and the research on this topic. So to inform research and inform our understanding, Betty Ford Institute, which is a nonprofit residential treatment center, they came together and about 12 individuals developed a working definition for recovery. They've defined it as a voluntarily maintained lifestyle characterized by sobriety, personal health, and citizenship. So like I mentioned, there's not one definition for recovery. So SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, which is a part of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, they have a definition as well. They define recovery as a process of change through which individuals improve their health and wellness they live a self-directed life and strive to reach their full potential. I think both definitions are great, and I pulled in a couple other definitions from some of the articles that we're going to discuss later. So students in recovery, they typically have a history of problematic substance use and are just working to maintain a life of sobriety, whether that means complete abstinence or working on harm reduction, and it's overall striving to succeed academically and in their recovery. So why are we looking at interventions for college students in recovery? Kind of how I mentioned there's a lack of uniform definition. Well, there's a lack of understanding of what the research says in terms of the effectiveness of initiating and sustaining recovery. So the lack of research, it doesn't, we don't have the information to inform practices, to inform schools and universities and policymakers to support and extend re the recovery process for students. And despite the pretty successful treatment programs that we have for initiating recovery with, within the field, we just don't have enough information to, to inform providers the best way to foster recovery and sustain recovery. And additionally, services available specifically for students in recovery from alcohol or drug addiction on campus, typically the counselors or health service centers aren't adequately equipped to support students in recovery or help students with severe addictions. And that being said, we know that there's additional challenges in the college environment. We talk a lot about colleges being an abstinence hostile environment. There's students have easy access to drugs, alcohol. There's a large culture that promotes the misuse of substances, large binge drinking habits. So students that are in recovery, it's just not a conducive environment to sustain recovery. And then also students that do receive support, they might not, they might be receiving support from friends, from family, or programs such as Alcoholics Anonymous, AA, but sometimes those sources of support, they don't effectively identify with the stressors or experiences of being a student. So this is why we really want to tap into identifying effective interventions for college students in recovery. And so I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer, who's going to provide some more insight on this. Um, so as Danielle mentioned, um, I'm a counselor with uh, UCSB's uh, Alcon Drug Program. Um, so our program is actually housed within our Student Health Center, but we work collaboratively um, both with practitioners at Student Health, of course, and then also our counseling and psychological services, um, as well as a lot of other departments on campus. Um, we use a harm reduction approach, so a lot of you may know what that is, um, but essentially it's a set of practices uh, aimed at reducing the negative consequences associated with drug use. So that can be things like 
distribution of naloxone, which is something our program does. Um, needle exchange services, we don't offer that here, but that's something that would be considered harm reduction. But essentially it boils down to um, the realistic view that you know we know students, many students are choosing to use substances and we really strive to meet them where they're at. So we're not an abstinence-based program um, per se, but of course we recognize that all substance use carries some risks and for some students, they are not able to use substances in a way where they're able to moderate, um, keep themselves safe and healthy. Um, so we really have a full spectrum of services and we do everything from prevention, education, and then of course we have intervention, um, you know, services, treatment, and um, recovery services, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So when we're first, I'll just talk about the process of how we work with students. When somebody initially comes our way, um, we always do just an initial uh, kind of case management consideration of uh, things like their safety at that moment in time, um, whether there's any suicidality, whether there's um, particularly high risk substance use that's maybe still going on, if this is they're in the early stages of maybe contemplating recovery or they're not sure about whether they're ready to get sober. Um, of course, we're always looking at basic needs. Do they have safe housing? Do they have adequate access to nutrition? Um, are they thinking about taking a break from school where they maybe need to meet with an academic advisor or get help with that process? Um, and any additional referrals. So this could be anything from if they're not already connected to a psychiatrist and we think that they're, um, they need to be evaluated, we may connect them to a psychiatrist through our student health um, center or we may look for a provider in the community if they don't have our insurance. Um, depending on, again, what's going on with them, if their needs are such that maybe they need to be seen a couple times a week and we're not able to, to manage that. We may connect them to a therapist in the community and then we'd focus more on the um, concerns about drugs and alcohol and sobriety and that therapist may you know, address trauma or depression or other things that are going on. So there's a lot of case management that we're considering you know, right off the bat when we're working with somebody. Of course, with any, any therapeutic relationship, we always really work to create a really warm and welcoming environment. We, we work really hard to establish rapport um, with students. We recognize it's not easy to come in and get help, um, no matter what stage they're at, if they're coming to campus sober, or if they're in the early stages, or if they're just really struggling. Um, so we really try and establish trust and let them know that our services are confidential. They're free for students if, you know, if they come in voluntarily. We do have some students who come in as a mandate, but that's sort of a different program that we have. Um, I mentioned earlier, we're always assessing for any co-occurring disorders just because these are so common with um, substance use disorders. So things like depression, anxiety, history of trauma is really common. Um, and again, you know, we're, all of our counselors are licensed marriage and family therapists, so we always feel it's within our scope to manage these things. Um, but there are limitations within our program. So for example, you know, if somebody has you know, a lot of complex trauma and they're really in need of, you know, more support than we're, we're able to offer, we might consider um, an outside referral. Um, we're always, you know, assessing for a need for a higher level of care. So this could be taking a break from school or participating in an intensive outpatient program, maybe while they're still in school or taking a deficit load of classes. Sometimes students will take break to enter residential treatment. Um, if they are really having a hard time, they're not able to, um, you know, move towards sobriety and maintain sobriety. Um, there's a lot of considerations, but there are students who, who really need to take some time off to either maybe go through detox or to get some more intensive treatment. And then I put medication-assisted treatment on there, but that's also um, something that our psychiatrists at our student health center, we have two specifically um, who are trained in providing medication-assisted treatment. So this could be um, prescribing things like uh, naltrexone and suboxone. Um, it's not within my scope, but we, we do have those conversations sometimes with students if we think that that's indicated and, and you know, we may refer over to student health for that. Um, of course, we're always you know, early on identifying treatment goals, establishing a treatment plan um, with the client's input, of course. Um, and a lot of it is, is teaching a variety of skills. So if, you know, especially if they're early in the stages of sobriety or you know, really trying to get sober, stay sober, we're, we're talking about you know, how do you manage urges, um, you know, recovering things like um, the five Ds uh, for managing, you know, cravings or urges when they come up. So delaying, distracting, discussing, drinking water, deep breathing, you know, skills like that. We mm -hmm. talk about refusal skills. You know, the reality for a lot of students is, especially if maybe they are in the earlier stages, they may be living in an environment where a lot of their roommates or housemates are still um, using substances in, in ways that aren't 
helpful to them in their recovery. And so how do you navigate those scenarios? You know, do you make the decision maybe not to go out with friends um, and to stay back? How do you talk with your friends about that? What do you say if somebody who maybe doesn't know offers you a drink or, you know, a substance that you're trying not to use? Um, we talk a lot about self-care, you know, really getting out of quick sleep, nutrition, setting healthy boundaries, things like that, um, utilizing support system. So um, if, you know, hopefully if people have friends who are supportive and are, you know, who are they have healthy friendships, talking with those friends, getting them on board with supporting their recovery, um, you know, looping in the parents. I know Danielle will talk about that later, but including family. Sometimes we have access to that, sometimes we don't. Um, and then, of course, looking at housing. So sometimes students need to change housing if they're living in an environment that's really not healthy or supportive of their sobriety. We do have sober housing um, both in Isla Vista and we have designated housing through uh, the residence halls where there are sober floors or sober rooms. Um, and then I, I touched on um, involving yeah, family and supportive relationships. So I'm going to talk also about motivational interview interviewing. That's something all of our therapists use um, really routinely, but especially in the early stages if somebody's really struggling with ambivalence and uncertainty about what to do. They may have thought about sobriety and they're recognizing that their substance use is a problem, but they also can't really imagine giving it up or they're just really struggling with that. We use a lot of motivational interviewing to move students along that stages of change model. So often we're seeing people in sometimes a pre-contemplation, but our contemplation um, phase, and we want to move them toward preparation and action and then um, maintenance. So um, a lot of you may be familiar with that, but I included some links if that's helpful. So in the next slide, I'll talk more about motivational interviewing. So some of you may have some familiarity with this, but this is a directive client-centered counseling approach uh, developed by uh, Miller and Rolnick. Um, it is, the goal is to, to really elicit behavior change by resolving that ambivalence. So as I said, having mixed feelings about making a behavioral change is really common. Most people can think about some sort of behavior, whether it's eating healthier, or exercising, and they can think of all the reasons it's really hard to make that change or they don't necessarily want to, and yet they also recognize all the benefits that would happen if they were to make that change. So it's really just a style of having a conversation that brings about the other person's reasons for making that change, and it helps for them to make the case for themselves versus the counselor or therapist coming in and, and explaining to the person why they need to make those changes. It's When change happens, it's not because the person's not aware they need to make the change. There are all these other barriers um, standing in the way. So it's really helping them to, you know, as I said, increase the motivation for themselves, start to think for themselves about what's going to work for them and what ideas they have and, and what sort of steps they might be willing to take. Um, so the approach is very empathic. It's really collaborative. It's a very non-judgmental um, approach. Uh, if you're doing it well, the client should actually do most of the talking. So the core of my skills, a lot of it is open-ended questions. So we all know what these look like. They're essentially questions that can't be answered with a yes or no. So a lot of it is, you know, if you were to make a change, what might that look like? Or what are the, some of the things that you like about drinking right now? What are some of the things you don't like about it or that aren't going very well? Um, if you were to make a change, what sort of things in your life would change or what do you think would be better? So it's a lot of those sorts of questions, and I'll talk more about them um, as I move down uh, the list here. Um, affirmations is another part of motivational interviewing, so it's kind of a fancy word for really just highlighting their strengths. So like I said before, you know, when students come in, I'll often say, I know it's not easy to come in and talk to somebody that you've never met before. You know, for some of them, it's their first time in any sort of counseling or therapy uh, type of situation. So it's really highlighting that it took a lot probably for them to walk in the door um, and to, you know, share some things that are very personal and often very hard to talk about. Um, if they're doing well in school, that's something I'd, you know, point out to them. If I can tell that they really care about their friends and family, it's really highlighting any sort of strength that we see, anything that they're doing well, any sort of quality or attribute that really is shining through even when things aren't going so well. Um, and a lot of motivational interviewing is also instilling hope. Sometimes people come in and they're so stuck and they're so unsure about how they're going to get their life back on track and moving in a healthy way that, that we sort of have to be that person at times to, to really help them to see that change is possible and that we believe in them and their ability to, to make that happen. A lot of it is reflective listening. So it's listening for you know, those statements that change talk um, that students may, may 
you know, hopefully use um, that's stating the case for either their ability to make change, their desire to make change, their need to make some change in their life, and it's really you know, noticing that and reflecting it back to them. So you're really amplifying and making that case for, for making the changes you're talking about, either cutting out the substance use, um, you know, really moving towards sobriety. Um, use of summary statements, um, that's something I'll often do, especially after a first session with somebody, you know, is just highlighting. So I'm hearing you say that on one hand, you know, drinking is something you do with your friends at the end of a long week and it's something you really like. And on the other hand, I, I hear it's really not working well for you, that your friends are worried about you and you recently had a citation or, you know, and sort of summarizing. Um, and it's, it's a way to really, again, start to amplify and, and create that discrepancy between what's currently happening and, and where they'd like to go in their life. Um, and also a big part of motivational interviewing is rolling with resistance. So instead of, you can think of, you know, wanting to almost engage in a dance with a student rather than a wrestling match. So if a student, you know, if you're sensing some resistance, that's really a, a cue to try something different. Um, and, you know, and really just kind of come up alongside them and, you know, just acknowledge that, yeah, it's really hard to make a change. How might you know if, it, if you were ready? Um, so it's, it's really just kind of rolling with that and, and honoring that at the end of the day, you know, people are able to make their own choices. We can't make those choices for them as much as we want people to be safe and healthy um, and honoring that, that they have their own process and, and they're the ones that get to make that decision. So I mentioned change talk, but change talk is essentially, you know, any sort of statement about desirability, reason, or need for change. Um, strategies for bringing about change talk include um, use of scaling questions. I do this a lot. So, if, again, if somebody's considering sobriety, we, I might ask them a question about, you know, how motivated are you right now on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being really motiv motivated, 1 being none at all. They might say, you know, I'm kind of at a 6 or 7. I'll say, wow, well, why a 6 or 7 and not maybe a 2 or 3? And they'll make that case again, I really have to make a change. My partner's really worried about me. I cannot fail my classes. I don't want to drop out of school. So they'll start to strengthen that case. So scaling questions, you can ask them about their readiness for change using a scale, uh, their motivation, their um, confidence in themselves. Um, evocative questions might be, you know, what's the worst thing that you can imagine happening if you didn't make a change? Or what's the best outcome you could imagine if you did? Um, looking ahead, looking back, what was different before you started um, drinking or, uh, you know, smoking weed or um, what, what, you know, what might your life look like in five years um, if, if you keep doing what you're doing, um, if you make a change. So it's sort of ex exploration using those strategies and those kinds of open-ended questions. Like I said before, pros, cons, what do you like about this, you know, the substance you're using, what do you not like about it? Um, Exploring its extremes, again, you know, kind of what's the worst thing you can imagine happening? Um, you know, what's your biggest fear if you weren't made to make a change? And, and a lot of just tell me more about this. So this goes back to you want the client to be doing most of the talking. You know, if they start to say something along the lines of change talk, you can always just follow it up with, tell me more about that. I'm curious about that. Can you say more? Um, so a really good resource for motivational interviewing, I mean, that was a very quick overview. There's, it it's, can sound really simple, but it's, it's fairly complex, and um, it's a bit of an art form. But you know, one really good handout, I think, is um, actually something you can find online. I included a link, and it's um, to an overview uh, that's used in smart recovery. Um, and then lastly, like I said before, you know, just really expressing confidence in people's abilities to either make or maintain the, the you know, behavioral changes they're looking at at making. Do you want to go into the next slide? Um, so I'm just going to run through these really quick. I mean, all of our therapists kind of have a different way of working with students and different interventions that we're pulling in. But I'd say a lot of us are using um, different uh, interventions from cognitive behavioral therapy. So a lot of it is just behavioral coping strategies, um, increasing awareness of, of the kinds of thoughts, feelings, behaviors students are having so that they understand how all those things are interconnected. Um, a lot of times it's, it's sort of examining their thoughts and, um, you know, kind of breaking those down and, and trying to replace those sometimes with, you know, thoughts that are more rooted in reality or just more helpful to them. Um, so we're, we're always working with them on shifting their ways of thinking and responding um, to things going on in their lives. Um, I, pull, I tend to pull a lot from DBT. Um, I like a lot of the skills that are taught in, in uh, dialectical behavioral therapy, especially distress tolerance, emotion regulation skills. We know that even without struggling with a substance use disorder um, or addiction, that college is a really stressful time, you know, and so I think that equipping students with other ways 
of coping with um, the stress from being at the place they're at in life without turning to substances, they need other skills. And so these can be really helpful for them. Um, some of you may be familiar with this, but introduce, I introduce sometimes the wise mind concept, um, radical acceptance. Um, so instead of being really stuck on, on, you know, wishing something were different, you know, it can be really freeing and comforting to just accept that some things just are and we can't change them. Um, and also, of course, bringing back that just really non-judgmental stance. So I'd really try to take that approach with students. Um, Solution-focused brief therapy. I love the miracle question. It's really great for starting to think about, you know, a focus on, on the changes in the life that people want to see for themselves. And then we do a lot of mindfulness-based interventions. So some students come in with some experience with meditation or mindfulness, but we talk about the benefits. We try to integrate that into our sessions. Sometimes we'll actually sit with students and do that with them. We provide a lot of resources for apps they can download or, or um, drop-in meditations they can do on campus or yoga uh, classes locally or other places where they can participate in more mindfulness if they want to. Um, and we just talk about how, how incredible the tool it is for coping with uh, cravings, stress, anxiety, and other intense emotions. Let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> so um, also in our work with students, um, we talk a lot about, um, or we, you know, we really try and provide some psychoeducation. So you know, students often come in with a lot of shame, um, a lot of regret about their use. Um, and we talk about, you know, addiction is a disease and it's not a personal failure. It's not, you know, that they are, are weaker or you know, anything along those lines that um, it's, it's, it's complex, but that there are biological differences that put people more at risk, you know, that some people are more at risk because of, um, you know, their, their family factors, things like that. So we also will sometimes talk about post-acute withdrawal symptom or syndrome, um, and that's usually um, a set of symptoms that can last for you know weeks, sometimes even months, um, after somebody becomes abstinent from substances. So that's important because a lot of times students will uh, have this expectation that once they stop using this substance, everything will start to just improve and get better. And that's often not the case, that it takes time. It can take up to two years for the brain to recover and um, find that's new, the new balance, um, or get back to balance, rather. Reward systems in the brain are especially impacted, so things that may be enjoyable, rewarding for somebody who's not struggling with the substance use disorder, you know, may not feel as pleasurable and as, um, as enjoyable to somebody who's, who's newly sober. Um, but post-acute withdrawal syndrome can include things like irritability, um, increased anxiety, depressed mood, um, difficulty with cognitive tasks, sleep disturbances. Um, we also talk about the differ differentiating between slips versus relapse. So a slip being um, you know, maybe a one-time use or somebody slipped up um, or in a relapse being really returning to the same patterns of use. Um, and the slip being an opportunity to get right back on track with, with somebody's recovery um, and not letting that derail all the progress that they've made. Um, and then it's also really important, it sounds really simple, but to just find other sources of pleasure. So, you know, being able to, um, whereas that person may have turned to substances before, helping them find other, other sources of enjoyment, whether it's um, a sport or a new hobby or, you know, reconnecting with a group of friends that they, they really felt connected to and really enjoyed. Um, just other things in their life that bring them pleasure. Um, I'll talk just really briefly about our Gouches for Recovery program. So this is um, a program that was started by my colleague Angie Bryan. Um, it's been in place for, I believe, about seven years now. Um, it's a really robust program. It, um, they offer meetings six days a week. Uh, they have meetings for undergraduates, women, graduate non-traditional students. It's not a 12-step based pro uh, meeting, but it does follow a structured format. Um, one of the things that's been really helpful to me as a clinician is um, having Gouches for Recovery interns, student interns. We have graduate and undergraduate who are available to reach out for, to uh, students who are considering recovery or sobriety or interested in re um, finding out more about the program or wanting to connect to a community. Um, or even somebody just thinking about going to a meeting is kind of nervous and wants to know somebody in advance and hear what to expect. Um, they can text um, as an outreach and they're happy to share their story or talk about GFR in more detail. Um, but yeah, I think um, probably this will be talked about more later, but we have meeting space. Um, we have areas for students to come and just study. We have office hours that the interns hold. Um, and there's also designated support staff in academic, house, academic advising, housing, uh, our DSP, Disabled Students Program, um, and other places on campus that um, are, are 
you know, especially helpful to those students who are either coming to campus in recovery or, um, you know, have become sober um, and who may be returning or um, just in that early phase. So that's been really helpful to those students too. Can you go to the next slide? Great. <clears throat> Oh, I just was going to touch on this. This is another thing that, you know, especially when we do ally trainings, is um, just talking about language um, that sometimes you'll still, still hear people use language such as, um, you know, refer to somebody in uh, recovery as an addict or an alcoholic. And, and there's, there's certain language that, that's fairly pejorative and that has a negative connotation. And so I think it's just it's really important to um, just be aware of, of the language that's more celebrating of recovery, that's more respectful, and um, doesn't have that, again, kind of that negative connotation with it. So, again, instead of an addict, you might use a pers person with substance use disorder or a person in long-term recovery. So I just wanted to touch on that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jennifer. So as she was mentioning, I just want to go back one more slide. She mentioned that this is a the services that she provides and in, included with Gauchos for Recovery and also sober housing. This is all encompassed within a collegiate recovery program. So I'm going to be talking a lot about that in a little bit. Um, and I just wanted to kind of show you a little bit of a contrast of what the services look like at UCR. So Jennifer talked a lot about how the marriage and family therapists are involved within the students' recovery. And at UC Riverside, we do have counselors that can provide similar services, but in terms of the peer support groups, that's really where students in recovery at UC Riverside, where they go. And our student groups, we meet twice a week. Um, we do tap into a little bit of cognitive behavioral therapy. We do um, tap into more of the 12-step model. And we're trying to expand to include Al-Anon meetings. So as Jennifer said, they have six meetings on campus at their university, whereas we only have two right now. So when we dive into the collegiate recovery programs, we'll see that services across various campuses are vastly different. So next, I just wanted to talk about what does the literature say? So Jennifer talked a lot about um, the different services that practitioners provide and the services on campus and I wanted to see um, in the research project itself we wanted to identify is that what's being talked about in the academic literature so I just did a quick little well, not quick but a literature review and I used an online database referred to as psych info and it includes journal articles book chapters um, dissertations various things of the sort and I included several terms to populate different articles that included you know college students university students undergrads grad students and then also included substance use substance abuse alcohol use alcohol abuse or dependence or addiction all these various terms as well as treatment intervention or therapy and overall it came about um, about 100 articles that fit my criteria i was really looking for different interventions um, for treating substance use disorders and recovery and looking at how experimental designs focus on this and so what I kind of came across was that majority of the articles, they included what was referred to as brief alcohol screening and intervention in college students. And the acronym is referred to as BASICS. This is definitely more of a harm reduction approach. The program is not designed for students who are alcohol dependent, and it typically only includes about two inter interview sessions. So it's not long-term services. The first session might be um, some psychoeducation, looking at what a student, how much they typically drink, how often, the amount, um, and also providing some normative data. So what is the amount and frequency in which other college students are drinking? And then um, also just providing them information about what alcohol dependence symptoms are. And kind of tapping into maybe wh why people use alcohol and different um, expectations for the effects. So psychoeducation can include a lot of that type of information. And then this first session might also include just a measure of readiness. You know, how ready are people um, interested in making a change in their life? And so then that second session is followed up by another interview and providing information from a questionnaire that they might have provided and just providing more information based on that specific student's use and providing just additional information. So 
overall, they'll kind of get some information about maybe their beliefs of alcohol, the consequences, risk factors, and then again, I, looking at their readiness. So they use a readiness ruler as their measure of readiness. And then at the end, the counselor or the nurse, whoever's providing this service on campus, will just wrap it up by establishing some goals for the student, um, identifying some strategies for them to achieve that goal, and then also providing information for local resources. So as I mentioned, this is definitely a brief intervention. It's not something targeting long-term recovery. And then another intervention that we see in the literature is brief motivational intervention, which is very similar to basics, but maybe it can be used for other substances besides specifically alcohol. Um, like I mentioned, as the other one, two components, similar in terms of a psychoeducation component, assessment of quantity, frequency, and the consequences of drinking. And then the second component, just including motivational strategies, personal feedback on their use, and then providing a normative comparison. So I was very surprised by this when I was looking at the literature, and I didn't really find what I was hoping for in terms of these collegiate recovery programs, similar to what Jennifer was talking about, you know, using cognitive behavioral therapy and really trying to tap into students' long-term recovery. And as I was previously mentioning that recovery is, there's not a definitive definition. And to my, you know, understanding of recovery, I had assumed that recovery would be included with the term treatment and intervention and program, because they're very interconnected. But a, a, what we see is that it's perceived as separate, and that maybe that these initial motivational uh, interventions might be the beginning of someone's recovery. And you know, just across the literature and in, the, in practice in public, people define things a little bit differently. So that was a large limitation to my initial um, literature search. So I went back and did it again and included recovery. I did it once with um, including the terms treatment and intervention and therapy, and I did it again without those terms. Came across the same amount of articles. So about of those about 20 of those articles that I came across included actual information about different different recovery programs and interventions. So what I saw in those articles was that most of the research was exploratory, exploratory or descriptive. So it might have been collegiate recovery programs talking about what they identify as important components of their program, um, some of the factors that they have identified to contributing to successful programs. As you see here in the um, first article that's listed, it was it's the, one of the most recent articles published, and it was identifying different factors from, you know, defining collegiate recovery, defining the success in their recovery programs, and factors that promoted success in their recovery programs, whether that meant funding, whether that meant administrative support, different factors. And so across these various articles, it was very descriptive. And so we just didn't really see a lot of quantitative data on students, um, you know, decrease in alcohol use or substance use, um, a little bit less intervention uh, information on relapse, um, less information on how it impacted their academic success. Um, we did get some information from various articles about the individual universities, but what we're missing is just information from across multiple universities. So we really do want to tap into what is this, what is the critical components of collegiate recovery programs to provide academic success and abstinence, sobriety, and what are those components that are perceived as you know, predicting success? So across these different articles, a lot of them t um, talked about these three main universities. And similar to what Jennifer just kind of dived into of what a collegiate recovery program looks like, a lot of these have similar components in terms of providing, um, you know, educational curriculum or um, sober living houses, 12-step meetings, um, intervention services by um, certified counselors, and you know, each program at the university is a little bit different, but a lot of them have very similar components. And a lot of the feedback on 
some of these aspects of the program. Um, we just, students identified that a lot of the aspects in the program were helpful in terms of having a recovery community, having that support from a program staff, having the availability of on-campus meetings, academic support, you know, having an additional person pro provide them the route to talking to Disabilities Resource Center. And then if the campuses had a space for their meetings or a space for students in recovery, having a place to hang out, you know, as I mentioned, colleges can be an abstinence hostile environment. And if you have that place where you can go and ensure that their substances won't be used, that just provides so much comfort to students in recovery. So collegiate recovery programs were pretty much initially started by ARHE, which is the Association of Recovery and Higher Education. So they provide um, guidance on how to start collegiate recovery programs and just a little bit of information on what these essential components should be. So I just provide a definition here of what collegiate recovery programs are. They're a supportive environment within the campus culture that reinforces the decision to engage in a lifestyle of recovery from substance use. It is designed to provide an educational opportunity alongside recovery support to ensure that students do not have to sacrifice one for the other. You know, tapping into that, making sure that there is a um, lack of retention. And so we currently see about 138 collegiate recovery programs across the nation and at least 30 additional collegiate recovery programs launching. For instance, at UC Riverside, we're trying to get a collegiate recovery program started. It takes a lot of work and a lot of resources, but campuses are achieving it. And I wanted to provide information on transforming youth recovery. Transforming youth recovery is a nonprofit organization and they provided a lot of funding for universities to start collegiate recovery programs. And they provide a little bit of guidance as well in terms of what are the critical components. Um, it's a pretty long list here, so I won't touch on all of them, but a lot of what we've been talking about is mentioned here, you know, um, available one-on-one um, -on -one support, um, mutual support groups such as 12-step meetings, having a space for students to gather socially, sober, and safely, and having organizations, departments, and services that the Collegiate Recovery can Program can refer students to for who need outside services. So making sure that if the students' needs aren't being met on campus, that they have re referral options to, you know, inpatient um, facilities or outpatient facilities. Or if there are a lack of counselors that have experience working with students with substance use, they have people that they can refer them to that have that experience using, um, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy for substance use needs. So across my two literature searches, I just wanted to provide some implications. So as I mentioned, there was a perceived disconnect between what we initially see as treatment and recovery. They're very interrelated, but it's sometimes perceived as separate. And then there's a lot of considerations for demographic factors. So when we have information in the research about a successful collegiate recovery program, what are the cultural factors of the students in that program? What are the gender, age? Um, what are the initial drinking levels of those students and drug use? Um, those are different things that we need to consider when we're generalizing our research. So just because one university was very successful with their collegiate recovery program, those same components might not be successful for a different population. So we really have to look at that and see what the outcomes are among the participants in a research article and study. And then also looking at if students had comorbidity, comorbidity of, with med, other mental illnesses alongside substance use. Um, are they suffering from anxiety, depression, and how can collegiate recovery programs support those needs as well? Is there components within these collegiate recovery programs that do that? And then overall, are all collegiate recovery programs, are they measuring readiness for change? Um, are there, when we talk about the factors that lead to successful outcomes, we want to make sure that if we're looking at research, that we have the same outcomes that we're measuring. Is that academic success? Is that um, percentage or rate of relapse? 
or is it readiness to change? What are the specific measures that predict successful outcome? And then, so there's just a lack of rigorous studies. As I mentioned, a lot of the studies were um, exploratory, descriptive, qualitative. We're just lacking information in terms of, you know, randomized controlled trial studies where they really control the different factors um, incorporated in different interventions. Longitudinal studies, looking at the success of students over time. Is it that they're just being successful in their recovery for one or two months, and then we finish collecting data on that for that research project, and then two months later, we know nothing about them. So longitudinal studies just is a much more rigorous study in terms of having information on what is effective. And then, you know, just different factors incorporated in these recovery programs, um, you know, peer support groups, is that a key component? Is it smart recovery or 12-step programs? Those two are a little bit different, and I'll kind of talk about those differences. Is it the different talk therapy models? Is it cognitive behavioral therapy that's better, or is it dialectical behavior therapy? So there's a lot of unanswered questions when it comes to looking at what are effective interventions and programs and components of collegiate recovery programs. So there's just a lot of need for research and we see an increase in the research in terms of, um, you know, there's a large increase of campuses taking on collegiate recovery programs, but we just don't have the research to support what they're doing. And at times, this research might be really informative for, you know, gaining admin support to start a collegiate recovery program or start some recovery services for students on campus. Maybe it'll help um, tie in funding and hiring different counselors with knowledge on how to support these students. So there's a lot of implications for having research to support what we do in our practices. And so now I'm just going to touch on just some effective ways to provide support in terms of family and friends. Um, so Keith was actually going to add in most of the input on this. So I'm not as, you know, in depth of how friends and families can provide support, but these are just some initial suggestions. So similar to psychoeducation for the individual, psychoeducation is learning about treatment and recovery process. It's super important for family and friends, just giving them that initial understanding of what their, their loved one is going through and what that path will look like. Family and friends can attend support groups as well. Al-Anon is similar to a 12-step step meeting. It's a community resource that provides support to anyone that is affected by a relative or friend's drinking or substance use. So having that person, the family or friend seeking support is needed for them as well. And then just throughout the, you know, learning about treatment and the support groups, you'll just gain a better understanding of what the recovery process looks like and just knowing that it takes a lot of work. And then also being a key factor in someone's life, you know, you want to make sure that you're providing support, but you're not enabling that person's unhealthy habits. So we're not encouraging a person who is striving for recovery to engage in drinking and it wouldn't be very fun for an individual who's in recovery to see a family or friend engage in heavy, risky behaviors, um, drinking or using substances. So just being a pro uh, providing a positive example. And then also knowing the signs of relapse, um, you know, knowing when this, uh, their loved one is at risk of potentially engaging in unhealthy behaviors again, and knowing how to step in to provide a little bit of support when it's needed. And so, as I mentioned, some, there's various types of community support. There's 12-step meetings, such as Alcoholics Anonymous, and there's Smart Recovery. Smart Recovery is very, uh, it's like an alternative to Alcoholics Anonymous. They use cognitive behavioral therapy and motivational methods. Jennifer kind of touched on outpatient and intensive outpatient programs. So maybe an individual who just needs a little bit extra support. So intensive outpatient programs. Um, they just address the needs of addiction, depression, eating disorders, uh, a whole gamut of different things that an individual might need. Um, but in outpatient services, they might not need to um, be under 
you know, round the clock supervision, or they might um, not need to be in a facility 24 hours a day. Whereas an inpatient treatment, that provides a little bit more intense um, services. So we have inpatient and residential services are pretty much synonymous, um, but it requires, you know, individuals to check themselves in a controlled environment to overcome their substance or alcohol use. And then we have also partial hospitalization or day treatment centers. And those are pretty similar terms as well. They're often used synonymously. And this refers to maybe group counseling, individual therapy, um, maybe providing individuals access to medical care if needed. Um, it's kind of seen as a step down service from maybe inpatient um, programs. Maybe someone um, was in an in, uh, inpatient treatment and now they're just receiving partial hospitalization or a day treatment. And then lastly, I have listed here methadone clinics. Um, so these are typically treatment programs to support people who have an opioid opioid addiction and they need to receive maybe some medication to help them begin their uh, recovery journey and they might have um, the opportunity to provide people with uh, naltrexone or suboxone and these are primarily uh, medication dispensed um, clinics and things like that. Yeah, so I just wanted to touch on, you know, what community resources look like and how those might differ from a collegiate recovery program in terms of collegiate recovery programs or, you know, college campuses really aren't fit to have, you know, inpatient treatment or um, really intense outpatient services, but there's a lot that college campuses can do for their students who are seeking recovery or, you know, trying to sustain recovery. So just kind of going back to what we've kind of learned and talked about of what the current practices are in the colleges and what the literature says. So the goal of this webinar was to kind of touch on like what are some areas of future research? Where can we, you know, expand the literature and, you know, provide some more information of what effective services are? So we just already have seen in terms of the lack of uh, research articles that students in recovery are an under-researched population. They're not widely used in research um, studies. So there's an overall need, no matter what, um, you know, what the intervention is, what the program is, there's just a need to provide um, more research to inform how students in recovery are successful or initiate recovery. Um, so I love this quote that I came across in one of the articles. Um, it was that collegiate recovery programs are an innovative campus-based model of recovery support that is gaining popularity but remains under investigated. So like I mentioned, um, a lot of the research articles were exploratory and descriptive. So there's just a need to really tap into, um, you know, what are the factors that promote and sustain recovery for students engaged in collegiate recovery programs. If that is a widely used intervention and program, you know, what are those key components that are effective? And just using research to develop a, a deeper understanding of the challenges and issues faced by students in recovery. As I mentioned at the beginning of our webinar, you know, um, students that are struggling with recovery, they have a lot of different challenges than maybe the um, typical typical person who is not in a university setting. And then also just identifying some of the factors that influence the development and the progression of these programs. Um, you know, is it, do we need a large amount of funding to develop collegiate recovery programs? Is it, um, you know, gaining administrative support? Is that what makes collegiate recovery programs su successful? So having, you know, the specific information and being able to compare it across universities and just really look at, you know, what were the key factors that influenced, you know, successful outcomes for students in recovery? Yeah, so that pretty much kind of wraps it all up. Um, I did just want to kind of provide one last little resource. Uh, I know we kind of went through a, a lot of this really fast, but for those of you who are, um, you know, currently 
in a part of a university or you're a student in recovery, um, just some steps that we can do to provide some initial support for students in recovery. So whether that's, you know, having a grassroots movement and having students band together to promote campus-based 12-step meetings, um, whether that's pushing admin to provide substance-free housing, um, you know, having that safe haven um, to be able to go home in a substance-free environment encouraging social events to be sober to ensure that you know individuals can go to an on-campus event and not be worried about an, ind an individual you know asking them to engage in um, you know substance use or alcohol use while on campus and just promoting you know substance-free social networks and you know that community that they know that will be um, sober and having fun in that sense and then also encouraging counseling services to provide training to clinicians, um, just different in types of um, treatment or interventions to support students with substance use disorder, with alcohol use disorder. So, you know, encouraging different administrators or specifically asking, um, you know, the counseling services to see a counselor that has experience with working with individuals with substance use disorder. And then just lastly, educating the broader campus community to reduce stigma. There's still such a large stigma about recovery and, um, you know, just the term like substance use disorders or alcohol use disorder. And we want to, the more that we educate the community, the more likely it is to reduce the stigma. So I just included some more links at the bottom here um, that can provide some information on maybe how to start campus-based 12-step programs or, you know, um, how to encourage counselors to use a specific model that um, might be more beneficial for someone who is um, struggling with substance use disorder. Yeah, so that is pretty much the end of our webinar, and I'm going to pop up some of the question and answers so we can dive into any questions that you all had. So the first um, question was this. Uh, you mentioned the need for research across university settings. That could mean one of two things, that you want to examine university or institutional characteristics, right? So compare mm -hmm. University A and University B, specifically focusing on what makes that university or inst college unique. Or it could mean you want to see if the findings about individuals right, or individual factors uh, replicate across settings. Which did you mean, and if you mean both, which do you prioritize? Yeah, definitely both. Um, I think right now it's looking at the specific outcomes. We have a lot of information about the characteristics of different programs, but I think there is now a larger need for the specific outcomes. Um, if you could kind of touch on the second portion of her question, the question again. Yeah, so, I didn't fully hear it. Yeah, it, it was my question. Let's just be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we, so basically, you know, so if you want to compare universities, what do you want to co compare universities or colleges? Okay. What do you want to compare for to see university yes, yes. level characteristics like student popular, like student demographics? Like you mentioned that, for example, different mm -hmm. nations might have different populations of students in recovery. So that would be a university, yeah. you know, an institutional characteristics. What's the demographic? Mm -hmm. Or are you more interested in just repli you know, replicating this idea of, oh, we know that factor A relates to outcomes at the individual level, but, but that research has only been done in one type of setting. Should we compare across settings? So what do you I want see, to yeah. the fact of the fact? Is it an individual level factor or a, like an institutional level factor that you think we should prioritize. Yeah, so I think there's a like a flow in terms of which we conduct research. So I, identifying effectiveness across individual campuses and having that information in the research articles in terms of, you know, the characteristics of participants, really a lot of information of what the different components looked like for the recovery services. Once we have all those components, we're able to then replicate. So if we don't have good information of what the characteristics looked like for the students, what the characteristics looked like for the program, it's hard to replicate it then. So we're still kind of at that point of what are the key components of a collegiate recovery program? And there's just a lack of consistency across universities of what you know, each university is able to offer in terms of those components. So uh, it's 
it looks like a lot of universities have 12 step um, meetings or on campus meetings or potentially housing. So if we wanted to do replication, we could look at, you know, two universities and look specifically just at those two components. So I think it's just initially having a, a understanding of what, you know, these different recovery services look like and then we can lead to replication and identify whether or not if the same service is provided across different universities is it effective for you know different populations but these same key components in the intervention or program um, you know is used in these different settings thank you okay we have a question here that reads are there any additional resources that you can recommend for us to read on or read in order to further understand the current quality of collegiate programs across universities? Yeah, so I linked a bunch of references at the back of this um, webinar PowerPoint, and I hope that we can link the PowerPoint um, on our Voice and Collegiate Recovery website so you can actually um, access this versus on YouTube. Um, but we see here this uh, Laudette et al. Um, they provide a several articles that really talk about the collegiate recovery programs and what they look like. And then a couple websites that I included in this PowerPoint, um, ARHE, Association of Recovery and Higher Education, that has a lot of information about what collegiate recovery programs are. So a, there's a lot of information out there, but if, um, if you have access to um, databases to look at research articles, some of those references would be great for to read on your own, but the general websites such as ARHE, the Association of Recovery and Higher Education, that's just a user friendly, easily accessible by the public to get an understanding of what recovery services look like and what collegiate recovery programs look like on campuses. The following question, what are your thoughts on a resource that simultaneously serves more than one campus of collegiate recovery students at once as a larger community? Would that be a different, more communal type of university resource with its own research needs? That's an interesting question because uh, when we were thinking about the topics to present in this webinar, we were interested in potentially looking at web-based recovery services. And I think that's like a new and upcoming option. So whether if someone was able to provide services at different universities, it, I think there might be some barriers in terms of traveling or, you know, time allocation to get to different to get to different universities. Um, you know, California has a CSU system, so there might be options for, you know, universities that are close in location, and that might be a potential option. But if we go to other states, they might not have, you know, three universities in the same area. So web-based recovery supports. Um, that is kind of new and upcoming. Um, you'll see on some of the like Alcoholics Anonymous um, dot org, they have potentially some online meetings. Smart Recovery has some online meetings. Um, so I think it would be awesome if there were like maybe Association of Recovery and Higher Education, maybe if they tapped into something like that and, you know, had online services for college students, because uh, kind of what we mentioned, it's, awesome that there are community resources, but students that are attending universities are just a unique population. You know, they're struggling with different things. And if they can have someone that understands their struggles and can provide additional resources in that sense, um, that would be great. So I think there's definitely options in the future, or maybe, um, who knows, maybe there's some under development, but I think online services might be the way to provide, you know, services across multiple universities, especially universities that maybe just don't have the infrastructure, resources, uh, funding for, for individuals in recovery. So the questioner added to their question and said, um, what about a program, for example, that is across campuses, across campuses in the same geographic area, such as say UCSB and Santa Barbara Community College? The, well, the uh, same geographic you know, region, I, but they're across campuses. Like, would you, would that, you know, what do you think about that type of a program? Say, I mean, in terms of, of you know, researching the effectiveness or, you know, I'm, I'm, that's not my scope of practice, but, um, you know, the Students for Recovery, uh, Gouchers for Recovery, rather, program does have um, quite a few Santa Barbara City College students who participate just because our, um, 
setup is fairly unique in that a lot of uh, Santa Barbara City College students live in Isla Vista. Um, and so they are very welcome to participate in those meetings. Um, they are utilizing those services, um, but there, of course, is um, support on, on the City College campus as well. So that doesn't answer your question about researching um, the value of, of that and, and what that, how effective that is. But um, yeah, we do have a bit of a unique situation in that sense. Yeah, I love that because, you know, we keep talking about universities, but we are like not including a whole nother population students that are attending, um, you know, community colleges. And that is an opportunity to potentially, you know, provide resources to a broader population. I was able to identify uh, the question and answer things and it looks like someone asked, um, they would like to hear a little bit more about the meetings offered at Gout Gauchos for Recovery for non-traditional students. Um, how can we approach this student population? Um, what are their needs or challenges? I know a little bit about Gauchos for Recovery, but, um, but Jennifer, I'm not sure if you know, um, if you want to add something, chat about sure. it first, I if mean, you have the, any information. Meetings, yeah, I mean, I, I can speak a little bit to that. Um, you know, I mean, the meetings are, of course, very confidential in nature, so I, I don't know exactly who, you know, who's mm -hmm. in terms of their identities, um, you know, who the non-traditional students are. But I, I know that they're, you know, you know, out in the early stages of Gadgets for Recovery, there was, you know, it started, of course, with just kind of the one main meeting, you know, the Students Recovery. Um, mm -hmm. It was 12-step based at the time, and it, it was open to anybody at any stage in, in any kind of, you know, recovery from any sort of addictive behavior, um, and, and, and still is, but there felt like there was a need, to, especially once we had a graduate student intern who was motivated and committed to leading that group over the course of, of the academic year, and he stayed on with us mm -hmm. and continues to, to lead that group. He started the graduate non-traditional um, meeting. So it tends to be for mm -hmm. students who just don't fall in that typical um, picture of, of, you know, what most undergrads fit. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's people who are maybe going to be, um, you know, older than maybe 23, 24. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, it could be an undergraduate student, but it could be somebody who has returned to school. Maybe it's um, a student veteran or, um, you know, somebody who's just at a different place in life. Um, it may be somebody from the LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. um, just anybody who, who, you know, feels they maybe don't fit as much as in the kind of more, I don't know, uh, just looking for a different kind of environment, perhaps. So I think yeah. I think it really is sort of up to the individual to self-identify as, mm -hmm. as wanting that. It's, it's a very... Mm -hmm. Um, inclusive group, so they're not going to turn anybody away. Mm -hmm. I had an undergrad who went to that group accidentally and, and still participated and felt it was beneficial, you know, but I think felt like she wanted to go to the, the group that was kind of geared more toward undergrads um, yeah. and students. So, but, you know, I mean, I think the needs of those individuals are different. A lot of times there's other factors. They may be in relationships or married or living with a partner. Mm -hmm. Some of them may have families that they're, they're supporting. Um, they're, you know, graduate students are especially stress, there's a tremendous amount of pressure, you know, depending on what they're working on and what kind of research they're involved in. Um, so there's a lot of special needs that those, um, that, you know, individuals who are maybe, again, non-traditional have that, mm -hmm. that look a little different than, you know, again, maybe a more typical picture of what, in, you know, a freshman coming in looks like. So that, you know, it could also be, again, a more mature transfer student, um, you know, who's, who's just looking for kind of a a population that's going to look a little bit different. And also mm -hmm. I think it's helpful to have that space that's separate too. And, and one of the things I didn't mention is, um, not to get off topic, but some of our counselors are located over at the Student Health Center and some of our counselors um, are located at a building that's, you know, right on the edge of campus but in Isla Vista. Um, a lot of grad students prefer to be seen over at the Student Health so that they're not in an environment where they're waiting to be seen by a drug and alcohol counselor um, mm -hmm. and they could run into somebody who they're a TA for a class for. Um, so I think the idea of separating out and having a different meeting too, again, creates a sense of a greater sense of safety and comfort and not having to worry about interacting with students that they may have a different kind of relationship with, um, a more professional uh, type of, uh, yeah, relationship with. So I think that's also part of um, the decision to, to offer those groups. Yeah, thank you. And I just want to add to that. Hopefully that kind of, you know, provides a little more context for why that, that group exists and what that looks like. Yeah, and so um, 
I mentioned this at the beginning of the webinar, but um, I help lead the student recovery meetings at UC Riverside, and I've been fortunate enough to be a part of the UC um, recovery network. And so every year that the conference among the 10 UCs in California, and we get together and kind of, it's like a working conference, and we talk about the different um, things that we're doing to support our collegiate recovery programs. And, um, you know, in terms of gotchas for recovery, I know that they are like veterans um, who are struggling with substance use or alcohol use or, you know, seeking recovery. And so they have a specific meeting like that for individuals, or they have an LGBTQ um, specific meeting. And, in terms of approaching the student population, I think that there's different methods of doing this, you know, um, trying to think about our recruitment strategies, whether that's, you know, specifically targeting that population and providing, you know, additional flyers or resources to maybe the veterans um, department or organizations or, you know, going to those events and flyering, tabling and providing just additional information to those specific populations. Um, so recruitment to attend meetings is already kind of a common um, struggle, but, you know, there's different recruitment methods that we can do if we want to target a specific population. And then in terms of needs and challenges, um, you know, every individual has many identities that they identify with. You know, um, we talk about like intersectionality. You know, I personally identify as a, um, a female, but I'm also, you know, identify as a student. Maybe um, my cultural background, Hispanic, um, a student in recovery. There's many different identities that I relate to. And so those all come with their different needs and different challenges. Um, you know, if I was a parent, I might have different needs than a student who's not a parent. And so when I was for like, I didn't think I'd disclose this from the beginning, but I am a student in recovery. And when I was beginning my recovery journey, um, I wanted to go to meetings that were, you know, I could talk to people and peers and individuals who had similar experiences. And I think when individuals are starting their recovery journey, they might seek that out because, you know, peer support and social support is a large component in recovery in recovery and just throughout one's journey and being able to relate on a different level and, you know, being able to talk about different challenges that are similar just might be a large factor in terms of, you know, sustaining recovery. Um, you know, someone once told me though, that as you get deeper into your recovery, you kind of recognize that we, everyone who is in recovery has similar struggles and challenges and needs. Um, so maybe initially that these specific types of meetings are needed for those who are, you know, trying to initiate recovery, but maybe as they get deeper into um, their recovery, that might not be the case and that they can find that a general meeting is, um, you know, appropriate and it meets all of their, their, you know, different challenges and such. So I think there are so many different factors that go into, you know, having successful meetings, but um, definitely having options for students is key. You know, no individual is the same. No intervention is going to work the same for each person. And so having the options for students who maybe identify as a non-traditional student um, is really important. And that's probably, you know, like I mentioned, research can inform, you know, whether or not that is you know, something that influences someone's success and recovery, or is it more of just like a perceived success? Maybe um, it's just perceived as being more successful, but, you know, general recovery meetings are beneficial for everyone. So there's a lot of um, ways that research can help inform this, but just, you know, anecdotally and being in the recovery community, there are definitely many um, different needs or challenges among different people. So, you know, that's why, Every college campus is unique in terms of the services that they provide, but if we come from a research perspective, it is beneficial to know what those key components are. So I want to remind um, participants that they can submit a question um, at any time or a comment. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, can I follow up on, on this very insightful conversation about variation among students in recovery. So mm -hmm. I implied this earlier in the presentation, but in this more immediate discussion, you're talking about sort of social identities, like a veteran, a non-traditional student, LGBT, et cetera. Um, and, but earlier in the conversation or discussion, you mentioned, you know, how, or, and even just now, I guess you said, you know, students in recovery might differ in terms of what they want 
or how they might benefit from services by their recovery stage, right? Are they new to recovery or old to recovery? And, and then of course, obviously type, type, you know, your, your sort of, um, your, um, your, your type of addictive disorder, right? Um, so I guess, mm -hmm. I guess I wondered, and I know what I'm going to ask is, you know, obviously ridiculous because I'm forcing you to choose, but I'm, I'm doing it with this idea that if, you know, in research, you can't do everything. You have to sort of pick mm -hmm. your questions. Like, so what is, you know, what is, is there a one of those that's more important sort of recovery stage versus addictive disorder type or substance type um, or, um, or sort of these social identities? Yeah, I think there's different ways to approach it. Um, I mean, just even in terms of the types of meetings, there are campuses that have, you know, um, meetings for students with eating disorders or pornography addiction or even electronic addictions. Mm -hmm. And I think it just sometimes might come down to the underlying concept. We keep saying addiction or, you know, use disorder. So it's like a behavior or an activity that someone is frequently engaging that's significantly impacting their life. Um, and so at UC Riverside, we have a vastly different student population in terms of needs. And it's, you know, for me being a student recovery and helping lead these meetings, it's, you, it's hard to, you know, attend to all these different needs. But I think what it comes down to is, you know, just these behaviors that are significantly impacting one's life. And if we did want to come at it from a research perspective, I think there's a lot of value in having diverse, um, you know, characteristics because then we are able to generalize that more. So if we did have research and it was specifically all students in recovery from um, alcohol use, we're only able to generalize those findings to students who are, um, you know, overusing alcohol. Um, so if we do find that a collegiate recovery program is successful among students with eating disorders, um, alcohol use, substance use disorders, and they're you know, about equally effective, the intervention or program that we use, then we're able to generalize that to a broader population. So, I mean, if there's, you know, these different ways that we're looking at it from like research or pra and practice, um, but I think the more that we can generalize, I think is the overall goal, just because if we're thinking about like resources, um, it's hard to have individualized interventions for everyone. Um, you know, we're already struggling to have, you know, counselors to meet the needs of, you know, the concerns of maybe anxiety and depression. And we have kind of seen an increase of potential anxiety and depression among college students. And now throw in, you know, a variety of different use disorders. And it's how do we, you know, target each disorder. And, you know, if we can find those interventions that are effective for multiple, I think that's amazing. So like with like cognitive behavioral therapy, we do see in the research that it is beneficial for anxiety, depression, and sometimes subs and substance use. So, you know, I think it's very important to have knowledge of what the student's characteristics are in terms of, you know, if you want to put a label on it, the disorder um, in terms of the research context, so we can generalize our findings and generalize um, what we find in terms of effectiveness. Um, but then, you know, just trying to tap into what is the underlying, you know, similarity across these individuals? And, you know, is there something specific about um, these differences that, you know, makes that makes a difference overall, I guess. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Additional questions or comments from the participants? I actually had a question for Jennifer. Sure. Um, so I was just wondering, like, if when you said that most of your um, counselors on campus and maybe just even yourself, um, you know, providing services to students in recovery, was there like a specific kind of training or education that you had um, before you provided services to students in recovery? Just because um, you know, anecdotally, I have heard that, you know, some counselors will refer out, um, you know, refer students to you know, other counselors because maybe they just don't have the skill set. So, you know, maybe like what is that skill set that is needed for counselors to provide services? 
That's a great question. And, you know, I mean, certainly I've been in my position now for eight years, and so I've learned a lot um, over these eight years. Um, I started out in community mental health, uh, where I worked with a range of mental health issues, um, sometimes, you know, some of which were substance use disorders and, and related problems. Um, and then I worked in a, um, a residential um, program for young adults um, with uh, borderline personality disorder, um, and so there were some substance use issues there, but but it really wasn't until kind of actually coming to campus where I really, you know, and, and I think at that point, collegiate recovery was still really kind of new. Um, you know, it was a newer concept on college campuses, and I was fortunate enough, again, to work with a colleague who's really been at the forefront of, um, of you know, helping to create those programs, and she developed that space and um, created the program here, so I've learned a lot from her, um, but I think, you know, Oh, I mean, of course, a lot of the skills just is, you know, that therapists have are, are you know, really helpful in working with, with students in recovery, but a lot of it is just the comfort and the familiarity with being able to talk about substance use issues, um, being able to talk about drugs and alcohol, and um, being able to ask about it, and um, just having an ease of, you know, use of the language and, and you know, being able to provide that support. Um, you know, I've been trained in motivational interviewing, um, which is something I did really early. I had some experience with it, but I did that pretty early on when I started working here, and that's been really helpful, um, going to a more intensive training for that. Um, but, you know, I think just becoming more familiar with the, the campus um, climate and just knowing the resources here, and, um, you know, I think that that's really been the most helpful you know, part of, of kind of growing into this role. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. So, you know, I mean, there's, I think I can't speak for everybody over counseling and psychological services. I think some of them are really comfortable, you know, working with students on these issues and some aren't as much. So some are more apt to refer over to our program. Um, but I think it's important all therapists have, you know, a comfort level in being able to, to talk about these, these things with, with clients because it's so prevalent. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that answers your question somewhat. Yes, thank you. So it looks like there are no further questions. I want to take this opportunity to thank our presenters um, and thank the attendees for uh, listening in. On your screen is uh, the website for our feedback survey. We um, invite you to please take that um, a survey, not only so we know how you felt about the webinar, but also to guide us as we go forward. and. Um, try to, as a community, develop uh, research um, to address the collegiate recovery community. So with that, I will say goodbye and thank you. All right, thank you so much. Thank you.